Hello, I'm Seal Dow, and this is Edible and Landscape Gingers for Your Garden. Welcome to the wonderful world of gingers. They are colorful and spicy, and some are even delicious. Let's explore the spicy side of gingers first. What do you think of when you think of gingers? Gingerbread houses at Christmas time are that funny looking root you buy in the grocery store. Actually, both of these are Zinderbur Aficionale. And that funny looking root you buy in the grocery store is actually considered a hand. And from that hand are long, fat, protruding fingers. From each protruding finger, a leaf stalk will emerge. And then the narrow green leaves. It also has a uh, two inflorescences, one basally and also at the tip of its leaf stalk. The inflorescence looks like green flat bracts and from each bract emerges a white flower with a maroon lip. These are really considered insignificant flowers because they're not very showy. The plant is used in ginger ale, ginger red, ginger beer, and uh, candy, ginger candy. Uh, when dried, it is used in cakes and cookies. And when used fresh, it is used uh, sliced and chopped up for your oriental dinner. This is an easy plant to grow. Just make sure you get a, when you purchase one, purchase a big, fat, firm, moist hand. Take it home and you can place it in a container or directly in the ground. If using a container, make sure it's rich, friable soil. And place it where the hand is actually showing slightly above the soil level. These particular hands were dipped into a root inhibitor so that the roots will not sprout in its transit to the grocery store. So it needs heat to help it uh, to emerge, for help it to break the dormancy. So put it where the skin is actually showing above the soil level and the sun will help it to pop up. It's an easy plant to grow, four feet tall, and uh, you need to protect it for the first couple of years from freezing, but after that, it's pretty, it's pretty hardy. This is curcuma longa, or turmeric. Rhizomes are boiled in water and then dried in ovens before being pounded into a powder for use as a spice. The immature inflorescences are also boiled in water and eaten as a vegetable. You can actually purchase these immature inflorescences in a specialty grocery store in the frozen food aisle. Uh, it's really fun. The individual flowers are quite delicious. Uh, you can use them, you can pluck the immature flowers or the flowers out for your salads or just eat them as you wander around the garden. The plant itself is fun to grow. It has gently ribbed leaves that reach four feet tall and then the flowers are shorter than the leaves, which is its common name, hidden ginger, because you have to move the leaves aside to find the hidden treasure. The inflorescence has a white coma or top whorl bract and with a green brush stroke on every bract. And then as you go down toward the leaf stalk, the, uh, the bracts are just a darker, darker green. From each pocket shaped bract is a white flower with a yellow throat and these are edible. The rhizomes come in a variety of yellow to a deep orange, but they're all the same plant. They're all curcuma longa. It, turmeric is also used to color mustard. That's what makes mustard yellow. You put it in soups and curries and a variety of dishes. You can use it fresh or dried. Easy plant to grow and a good plant to eat. There are two types of cardamom, and this is Elateria cardamomum or green cardamom. It is native to southern India and Sri Lanka. The sweetly fragrant green seed pod of this plant is used whole as individual small black seeds or ground. It is used in northern India dishes to include sweetmeats and desserts. This plant cannot be grown in the Texas Gulf Coast region, but the spice is available at specialty spice departments. This is Amomum subulatum, or black cardamom. It is native to the damp forested valleys of the eastern Himalayas to central China. The largest producer of this black cardamom is Nepal. Usually black cardamom is sold whole as seed pods. Dried over open flames, a smoky flavor is used to flavor hearty meat stews and the broth of the noodle soup called pho. This plant cannot be grown in the Texas Gulf Coast region, but the spice is available in specialty spice departments. The reason I just showed you two cardamoms that cannot be grown in our area is because of this plant. 
This plant is Alpinia nutans. Sometimes it is sold as cardamom, but its seed pod cannot be substituted for the true green and black cardamom. It is an easy plant to grow. It has lovely, fragrant green leaves. When it's a super hot day, the essential oils just bubble out of them. It takes a lot for it to freeze back, so it's almost always evergreen. It can be grown in dense shade, part shade, part sun, and if not frozen back, it in the springtime, it has this lovely panicle of shell-shaped flowers. So its common name is also shell ginger. But this is truly known as a false cardamom, Alpinia nutans. This is Alpinia galanga, or greater galanga. Its rhizome is used fresh or dried in oriental cooking, mainly Thai, for its spicy flavor. Fresh rhizomes are often cut into thin slices for Thai soups and stir-fry, and can be grated for curries. It is also used in Chinese medicine as an antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory agent. The leaves can actually be cut, washed, and laid in a soup bowl. Then you take an oriental soup, ladle it on top of that leaf, and the uh, the hot temperature from the soup will cause the essential oils to bubble up from the leaf and flavor the soup. It's a great way to serve an oriental soup. The rhizome is uh, is is what you see in the slide. This is bare rooted, washed, and the and the roots are cut off. Uh, they're very easy to grow. This is a super easy plant and very pretty in the landscape or as a backdrop for an herb garden. It likes shade to part shade. It grows four to five feet tall and it says it supposedly blooms even if it's frozen back. I've had this plant 15 years. I've never seen a bloom, but maybe you'd have better luck. This is Alpinia officinarum or lesser galangal. The rhizomes of the southeastern China native have a spicy, sweet flavor and an aromatic scent. In Asia, the rhizomes are ground to powder for use in curries, drinks, and jellies. In the landscape, the long, thin, aromatic leaves are grown in tight clumps. Multitudes of white flowers with red stripes appear at the top of the thin leaf stalks in the spring. Flower spikes only appear if the plant has not been frozen back in winter. Lesser galangal is easy to grow in the garden or in a container with rich soil and plenty of moisture. Keep it protected during freezes until the plant is well established. This is Bozenbergia rotunda, Chinese keys, or finger root. In herbal medicine, Bozenbergia rotunda improves appetite, aids digestion, and reduces gas. It is used as a fresh or dried vegetable because of its aromatic, spicy flavor. In Thailand, the leaves are eaten raw in salads, and the rhizomes are added to vegetable soups and curries. It is easy to grow in a shady spot in the garden or in a container. It grows as an understory plant where it multiplies to form a pretty colony. In midsummer, a petite pink and white tubular bloom appears almost at ground level from the center of its leaf cluster. When this plant falls dormant in winter, it must be kept dry or the rhizomes will rot. Just keep it in a raised bed and that should solve the problem. In the right hand lower corner, is what the rhizome actually looks like. Those long extensions that look like tapering fingers are part of the rhizome, which is why it's called finger root. And the label on the package says laser ginger. I have no idea why. This is Canferia galanga, or Kincur ginger, also called a peacock ginger. The rhizome is used whole or chopped in oriental cooking. It is also used as an ingredient in Baras Kincur, a favorite Malaysian beverage for children. There are different varieties of Kampiri Galanga. The photo in the upper left is the green variety. It's actually a bit taller, six inches tall, with a cluster of beautiful green leaves. And in summertime, in the middle of the crown, will have a succession of white flowers with a purple lip, easily grown in the ground or in the container. In the bottom right is a different variety. This is Cantheria galanga red flat leaf. This grows prostate to the ground. Truly, the leaves look as if, as if it is hugging the ground. And from the center is a very similar uh, white flower with a purple lip. These are beautiful, easy to grow in front of the border, in, uh, in mass, gorgeous in mass, these purple leaves. And they can also be grown in a herb garden. This is Zingiber myoga or myoga. 
The spring shoots of this plant are often pickled and dyed red. The summer flower buds are also edible and can be eaten raw or fried as tempura. Buds develop underground, which must be harvested before they emerge. A shallow layer of sawdust is sometimes laid around the stalks, so the buds may be found by pushing the sawdust aside. Buds are picked every two or three days for up to two months. Myoga blooms from mid to late summer. It must be protected from freezes until it's well established. In the slide, you'll see two different kinds of the myoga plant. In the bottom, that is the green variety with the beautiful yellow basal blooms. In the top middle is the variegated Zingiber myoga, and it's also ca called by the common name dancing crane. This is curcuma amata, or mango ginger. The rhizomes are not often used as a ground spice, but eaten raw, pickled, or cooked whole. The name mango ginger refers to the smell of the rhizome, which is similar to an unripe mango. This is a vigorous grower that produces large oval rib leaves and long stemmed inflorescences. Bracts are tinted purple with petite yellow florets emerging from each bract. It is an early summer bloomer that repeats all summer long. It's a spectacular performer in the garden. It's edible with beautiful foliage, a long blooming season, and tropical cut flowers. This is the beginning of the section on gingers that are used as ornamentals in the landscape. This is the first plant group. They are called hedicums or butterfly gingers. They are called that because the flowers look like butterflies. They're shaped like big fat butterflies. This one is Hedicium coronarium and it is the most fragrant of all gingers. Its inflorescence consists of flat green bracts and from every bract emerges a beautiful fat white blossom. Hedicums usually have flowers that only last a day, but the bracts have many flowers per bract so that when one passes or one dies, other flowers take its place. So there's a very pretty uh, succession of flowers throughout a week or more. This is Hedicium coronarium, the full-size plant. As you can see, it has the leaf stalk, alternating leaves, and it's topped with that beautiful inflorescence full of white blossoms. This is an easy to grow plant in part sun to full sun. It can be planted directly into the ground in a large container, in a wet ditch, or even submerged into a pond. This is one of the very few hedicums that can be used as a pond ornamental. Hedicums do not have a natural dormancy, which means that when a first cold wind blows, they don't care that it's cold. They will continue to grow and sometimes even bloom. What causes them to go into a dormancy is a full-on freeze. The freeze will freeze the water molecules in its leaf stalk and leaves, and it will cause the plant to go into dormancy. In springtime, when the soil warms up and the air temperatures warm up, they are one of the very first ones to, uh, to spring to life. This is Hedicium samshiri, and what you're seeing flying around the screen is a cartoon of a luna moth. Hedicums, the larger blossomed varieties, are more fragrant in the late afternoon and early evening hours. Its fragrance attracts the luna moths to it because they are its pollinators. Larger blossom flowers are more fragrant than its smaller blossom cousins. There are also fewer blossoms inside the bracts of these particular flowers. The smaller flowers have more flowers per bract. This is Sedicium Disney, and what you're seeing flying around is a butterfly. These smaller flowered Hedicums attract butterflies. There are also more flowers per bract. So these are actually, they last a bit longer than their larger flowered cousins. Uh, Hedicium Disney is a really great one because it's short in front of the border. Uh, they're, they only get four feet tall. They have blue-green foliage. They can grow in part sun or full sun. Easy, easy to grow and always attracts butterflies. This is Hedicium Daniel Weeks. It is one of the earliest butterfly gingers to bloom, usually showing up in your garden in middle to late May. It repeat blooms throughout the summer and into the fall. It's a big, fat blossom, with very fragrant, with a yellow-orange patch. 
Uh, it is a five to six footer and growing in full to part sun. This is Hedicium Lemon Beauty or Yellow Butterfly Ginger. They have huge 12 inch uh, inflorescence with sunny yellow flowers and orange stamen and orange throat. It's a beautiful mass of yellow flowers. Uh, it's on top of a four foot stem. It blooms from the late July through October, early October. This is a very easy one to grow in part sun. We've never actually tried it in full sun. The only place I've ever seen this is in Mercer Botanical Gardens, uh, which they have allowed us to take some for our sale this year. Super rare to find and super easy to grow. This is Hedicium Pink V. She's a very special ginger because she loves to bloom in high heat. Even when it's 104 degrees outside, she's in bloom. She loves just a flower. She's called Pink V because of the creamy white flowers, has a pink V stain on its petals. These are actually cups of nectar for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will always be attracted to her, and it, they're just fun to watch them as they go from flower to flower to flower. Even though she likes to bloom in high heat, it does take water for her to continue to grow and continue to bloom in that kind of temperature. This is Hedicium palani, or orange butterfly ginger. She's pretty spectacular because she will bloom nonstop. As soon as she starts to bloom in late May, she continues flush after flush after flush until the freezes force her down. She's a wonderful great ginger. She's very tall at seven feet. She has bright orange, medium-sized blossoms. She has orange uh, petals and an orange stamen, and she's just pretty, pretty, pretty. Hedicium Elizabeth. She's a true pink butterfly ginger. She has uh, fat, almost ruffled pink flowers. Uh, she blooms in early summer and she will stop in the high heat and bloom again in fall when the temperatures cool down a bit uh, less than 98 degrees. She's one of the deepest pink butterfly gingers that we have. It's a, a really pretty one and very fragrant. Attracts butterflies. This is Hedicium thursiforme, crossed with Maximum. It's an extremely rare butterfly ginger. I've never seen it anywhere else except for Mercer. It has a, it's about four to five feet tall and blooms right when the temperatures get super hot. Right when it's about 97 degrees, it says, now it's time to show my pretty. And these, uh, it's a cross between a thursiforme, which is a pin cushion kind of blossom, to a maxima, which is a fatter blossom. So these have long extending stamens and medium size, uh, pretty white flowers. This is a pure white with a pure white stamen. And it's just every single bract has four to five blossoms per bract. And they just bloom in succession. One once that high heat starts, it's succession after succession of these beautiful masses of white flowers. Very pretty. And uh, it's very decorative even at night because that white just draws your eye to it. This is Hedicium Dr. Moy. It is a hybrid from Dr. Yin Dun Moy from the San Antonio Botanic Gardens. It's one of the very first variegated butterfly gingers. It has peachy uh, butterfly shaped flowers with a darker orange throat. They're very fragrant. What makes it so unusual is that they have wide splashes of white variegation. Usually when you see a white variegation that is an absence of chlorophyll which usually makes this a little weaker plant not as vigorous. But Dr. Moy made sure that this was a vigorous plant. It could be planted in full sun, part sun, and it's vigorous. It doesn't take over but it's a strong performing ginger. It is a uh, easy to grow. It's about four and a half feet tall and uh, it's very hardy. You plant it in the garden, uh, but it's just as pretty in a large container. This is Hedicium Tahitian Flame. It is the more heavily variegated sport of the previous Hedicium you saw, Hedicium Dr. Moy. It's a dramatic splashes of creamy white variegation against this blue green shaped foliage. In the underneath of new foliage, it has a burgundy blush. Beautiful plant, strongly variegated. We don't usually put this in full sun. We usually put this in part sun. It blooms nonstop. It's very pretty, it has orange flowers, much like Dr. Moy. Even the inflorescence is variegated. Very pretty plant and it's pretty much hard to come by. 
uh, it's, uh, there is another variety called Tahitian flame. Tahitian flame is a little bit shorter. This one gets to uh, five feet tall and uh, works really well back of the border. Very pretty. Let me introduce you to the King Kong of butterfly gingers. This is Hedicium Kong. This is a towering plant. This is one of my absolute favorite Hedicums. It gets to 10 feet tall with a two foot tall inflorescence. I wait all year for this to bloom, all year. Hummingbirds zip to it, butterflies like it. It's just a fun plant. And what's really interesting is that it's tight. Uh, the leaves suck. Usually when you have a plant this tall, it takes up a big space. But it almost grows like a vase. The base of the inflorescence, excuse me, the base of the leaf stems are tight. They're like one inch apart. So it looks like a vase, tight on the bottom and open at the top. It's very dramatic. It's a great accent plant. And it's just fun to grow, fun to grow. But make sure you water it well because uh, it it uh, it needs a lot of water to grow that tall and to have that kind of inflorescence. The inflorescence, it keeps growing. Uh, it keeps producing leaf stalks and inflorescences, but it stops in August, late August. So it's a, about a month and a half of spectacular bloom. By the way, the gardener standing with Kong is Geraldine Smith. She was a veteran of the ginger group at March Mart for many years. This is Hedicium flavescens. It is the fall blooming Hedicium. This is the last of the year's bloom. It starts around Thanksgiving and continues through Christmas if there's no freeze to knock it down. It has wide, like three inch wide flowers on flat green bracts, but there's multiple flowers per bract, so they last a long time. You can have a bouquet of Hedicium flavescens at Christmas time because they're a big fat flower. They have a big fat fragrance. Fun to grow and they're yellow and it's almost a golden patch on its petals. So it fits in with the fall decorations. Really easy to grow and it's 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 great fun to see a plant blooming at Christmas time. This is Hedicium gardnerarium, a hybrid, or the Kihili butterfly ginger. If you want a piece of Hawaii, this is it. The word Kihili means a long pole decorated at one end with a cluster of feather plumes, and they're used as a ceremonial emblem uh, for the Hawaiian royalty. Uh, this is very much describes the blossom head on this particular plant as yellow flowers with long extending orange stamens, and it looks like a a pole with lots of feathers on it. Uh, it's it's a really fun. It's a compact plant. The reason why it's called uh, the hybrid, apparently it has larger flowers than the regular kahili, and it has a sweetly scented fragrance. They're really pretty, especially planted in mass. And it looks like a Hawaiian landscape. This is just a slide to show you some different uh, flower shapes. Uh, the the Siam Swam and the Hedicium gomesianum are both epiphytic Hedicums, which means they actually grow into tr they grow in trees. They uh, they like to be in the pot only. They're very very tender, and they have to have loose, friable, barky soil. Uh, they have extending stamens. Both of them have extending stamens, and they're just an unusual flower shape. Gomesianum is almost frilly and fluffy, and just a beautiful beautiful bloom. The next three. Fireflies, Clown Suit, and Pink Sparks are some hybrids by the great hybridizer Tom Wood. Fireflies is one of the finest ones for short. It grows three to three and a half feet tall, and it blooms nonstop from the end of June through frost. Very pretty. They have small flowers. Butterflies love them, but it's a nice short hedicium. Tight. Not, they don't go rampant. The Clown Suit has a fun recurved petal so it looks like the ruffle on a clown's collar. Pink sparks is like a pink pincushion. They have long extending stamens and soft pink flowers. Now pink sparks only blooms in August and it grows to be about five feet tall, but it has a round inflorescence. It almost looks like a big ball of pink flowers. This is a Hedicium seed pod. If an inflorescence is left on the stalk, sometimes the individual bracts will form seed pods. And this is almost a mature seed pod. Usually the red part, those red bumpies, every one of those bumps are, is a seed. And when it's mature enough, that red almost disintegrates and it just drips down. Uh, that uh, it, 
they should be planted immediately into little pots. I like to put uh, the individual pots into Ziploc bags and put them on a heating mat under grow lights to germinate quickly. Uh, you can, after they've germinated and uh, they have a good amount of leaves on them, then you can take them out of this uh, very carefully. Take them out of the Ziploc bag and put them on a Sunday windowsill until they're big enough to plant individually. It takes three years from for a seedling to mature into a flower-bearing plant. But you never know. You might have a new cool cultivar. This is another genus in the ginger family. These are curcumas, and they can be separated into two groups, spring blooming and summer blooming. This is spring blooming curcuma, curcuma alata. They are known for their giant, massive, gorgeous inflorescences. They are 18 inches tall and 6 inches wide. The tall uh, the top whorl bracts are called a coma. Hers are a bright fuchsia pink. As the bracts go down toward the leaf stalk, they turn a uh, deeper green. And from each bract emerges a white little flower. They have tall uh, leaves. Uh, this gets six foot tall. And she likes full sun. Gingers have a rule of thumb. The taller the ginger, like Kong, ten footer, he likes full sun, bright sun, whereas the shorter gingers, those that are 1 inch to 18 inches tall, like shade. They like to hide under the canopy of other leaves. A medium-sized ginger is a 3 to 4 footer, and they like filtered sun, part sun. This was a uh, spring blooming ginger. She will start blooming in late April. By the end of May, she has finished blooming and will not flower again. However, she has giant leaves. They're gently ribbed with a burgundy midriff, and uh, she's very fluid. She moves in the sun. She always is just moving, even in the still of a summer day. By late August, excuse me, by late October, early November, the cold winds come. It may not be the first freeze, but it's one of those, it's a northerner, and you know it's cold weather outside. Well, that cold air will actually touch her leaf, and it's a signal to the plant to go into dormancy. She drains the energy from her leaves through her leaf stalk into the rhizome. It takes a couple of days for this particular plant because she's so big. The only time you need to remove those leaves is when they have separated from the rhizome. Sometimes if you cut off the leaves because they look a little ratty, you have destroyed the process of her draining her energy from the leaves to the rhizome. And if she's allowed to do that completely, then she will be more mature next year. She'll put on more blooms, more foliage, and be a stronger plant. She will be in dormancy. She'll be sound asleep until the following spring when the air and the soil temperatures heat up. And she'll be one of the first ones to pop up. So in late April, you'll see these gorgeous inflorescences pop out of the ground, and then you'll get to see the fluid action of her leaves. Beautiful plant. Curcuma raspberry. She is one of the most floriferous curcumas we have. In the springtime, in late April, early May, she will emerge uh, her inflorescences at the same time as her leaves. Her inflorescence is a raspberry red. Uh, the, the, the bracts, the top whorl of bracts, all the way down to the middle of the inflorescence are a bright raspberry. Then they fade to green. They have creamy yellow uh, petite flowers emerging from each pocket-shaped bract. And her leaves are a nice, a nice bluish-gray green leaf with a burgundy midriff which feathers into the green. It's a very pretty plant. And at the same time, you will have clusters of three to four flowers per cluster. She'll stay that way for a solid month on a short little flower stalk. She will rest, and then she will put on another show. This is curcuma raspberry in July, early July. She rests for a full month, and then she puts on taller inflorescences. She will now be 18 inches tall at the base of her inflorescence and then she'll have another 10 to 12 inches of flower. 
These, she has a beautiful raspberry colored bracts, and this is deeper. The older she is, the bigger she gets, the taller her inflorescence, and a stronger plant. These are beautiful plants. They can be planted in full sun to part sun. Easy to grow, easy to bloom. This is another spring blooming curcuma. This is curcuma scarlet fever. She blooms at the same time as her leaves emerge. Her blooms are short, about 10 inches. They, uh, the top whorl of bracts, the coma, are tipped in burgundy. Her bracts are light green, and they hold the white and yellow petite flowers. After a month, by the end of May, she is finished blooming for the year. But her leaves grow into a height of five feet. But what is so dramatic about this plant is her scarlet uh, leaf stalks. The leaf stalks are a deep burgundy red and it goes all the way up to the mid vein of the leaf as they feather into the leaf. It's a very beautifully uh, landscaped ginger. Uh, they move because of their short leaf stalks. They move and they're very fluid. It's a very beautiful plant and very dramatic. This is the first of the summer blooming curcumas. This is curcuma twister. She's one of the very first uh, to bloom in the summer blooming series. She blooms in late May, early June. She is called a Siam tulip ginger because her inflorescence stands above her foliage. She's very pretty and petite. She's 18 inches. She's called twister because those bracts, which are usually stacked, they're usually stacked one upon the other, theirs Hers is twisted. They kind of like twirl around the leaf stalk. She's a really pretty thing. She's very, uh, she's pink, she's green, she's white. She's lovely, very, very pretty. She clumps slowly, but she could be in a container or in, uh, in front of the border. She's lovely and repeat blooms all summer long. If you love orange, let me introduce you to Curcuma roscoiana, pride of Burma ginger. She's a bright, bright orange from the tip of her coma to the base of her lower bracts. She has petite, creamy white flowers from each pocket bract. The older she gets, in other words, next year, she'll have a larger inflorescence, more mature. She'll be a stronger plant. This year, as you can see, these were in pots. They were the first year, and they're blooming like crazy. Uh, it's a fun plant. They bloom all summer, but starts in July. Uh, then she'll continue until it gets a little cooler, say the beginning of October, and then she'll stop. But it's a beautiful summer, summer array of orange. This is what a mature curcuma roscoiana looks like. It is a deeper orange, it is a stronger inflorescence, and you can see the beautiful uh, maroon uh, of the leaf stalk. The reason why I'm showing you this slide is what I often do at home. Uh, if you have a hidden ginger and you want to show off your inflorescences, you want to show, show everyone how gorgeous these flowers are, you can trim some of the front foliage off so you can see the flowers. If you remove too many of the leaves, then it loses their vigor and they can die. So just remove a little bit, especially if you're having a party or a show. It's a great way to display your inflorescences and your gingers. I would like you to meet the curcuma that loves to bloom. This is curcuma emerald chaco zebra. Let me explain that name to you. It came to the United States as D curcuma DT585, but some nursery over here decided that's never going to sell. So they looked at the inflorescence and said, you know, it's a little emerald color. It has uh, zebra stripes that look a little chocolatey. So they named it emerald chaco zebra, and it stuck. This is a very floriferous uh, curcuma. It'll start blooming in June and put up another scape by the end of June and another scape and another scape and another scape. One plant the first year will easily give you 12 inflorescences. That's huge. This plant just loves to bloom and doesn't take over. It's a tight clumper, but it's just so much fun. Uh, it's a green scape with these petite purple flowers and it's unusual and that it's a hybrid cross between a curcuma alismatifolia, which is like a wildflower in Thailand, to a hybrid. 
and so it's a it's a very unusual genetic material but it's a it's a great bloomer and it's very very hardy you plant it in the ground you plant it in a pot it doesn't care it just wants to bloom if you've got room in your garden for a runner then this might be one for you this is curcuma rubro bracteata it used to be known as curcuma flaviflora, but they did some research and found it had been named before, so they went back to curcuma rubro bracteata, or fireball curcuma. It's even called a fire plug curcuma. It's, uh, the bracts are red, and they're stiff, very stiff bracts with the yellow tubular flowers. And you see at the base, there's hardly any uh, leaf stalk on this. It is not a cut flower. This is just a fun plant for the garden because these guys love to bloom. They love to run. Their rhizomes look like ribbons. They uh, they have a leaf stalk and they put out a ribbon like three or four inches. Then they put another leaf stalk and every single leaf stalk blooms. It's short. It's three to four inches tall and it's very bright. You can see it from a distance. It's a very cool, unusual plant, but it is a runner. So if you plant it in one spot, by the end of the season, you've got it six feet over. But you've also got 12 plants full of little fire plugs. It's fun. These are the brand new cyan tulip hybrids. Thanks to Tim Chapman for introducing them this year. Tim likes to go all over the world, find gingers, and then introduce them in the United States. We, got, we acquired these from him. So thanks, Tim. This is Curcuma Sawa di Apollo. It's a beautiful red in fluorescence, red from the tip of its top whorl of bracts down to the very base of its stem. Even the, the, the leaf stalks of the leaves look brushed with the red. They're very pretty. This is only 18 inches tall. From every single solid red bract is a white and lilac petite flower. Very dramatic. It works well in the front of the border or in a container plant. The next one is Curcuma Sawadi Enchantress. She has a beautiful inflorescence of uh, white top bracts that fade into a deep red burgundy bracts. From each pocket bract is a little white tubular flower with a yellow throat. This one grows to two and a half feet tall, but can easily be grown in a container or in the garden. The next one is Curcuma Sawadi Honeymoon. Very cool. Uh, this is a, uh, the top whorl is a deep pink, and the bottom bracts are brushed with sienna. The individual flowers are peach-shaped or peach-colored, and it's really a pretty combination of peach-colored blooms with a sienna bract against the green leaves. Very pretty. She gets to be two feet tall, can be grown in a container or in the ground. These are new, super rare, and we have very limited quantities. This is a very unusual inflorescence for curcumas in that it's pure white. There's not a hint of green, not a brush of green on any of those bracts. This is curcuma chidi white. And I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but it looks like chidi white. It's a cyan tulip and that it is uh, the leaves, the inflorescence is set above the leaves and inside every single white bract is a sunny yellow flower really pretty thing. It's, uh, it only grows to two feet tall and it can be put in a pot or in the ground. Uh, this is very unusual, it's very rare, and it's very, very pretty. This is a slide to show you what happens when you put a curcuma in too much sun. This is curcuma orantiaca and she's, uh, she likes shade. Uh, she blooms, grows very well in filtered light conditions. If you put her in too much sun or any ginger in too much sun, the leaves will fold. They're protecting the stomatas, which are on the underside of the leaf. The leaf will get a brown tinge to it, a brown crispy edge to it, and doesn't look very pretty. So it's important to plant a ginger in its right location. Tall gingers like sun, short gingers like shade. And these poor babies look like they're cooking. This is an old-timey ginger, and they put it into a new genus. It used to be Stellianthus and Volucratus. Now they put it in with curcumas, and it's now listed as Curcuma macroclamus. It looks like a miniature curcuma scarlet fever. It only grows 10 inches tall. It has a red leaf stalk, a red midvein, into these very pretty green leaves. Uh, and in springtime, as the leaves emerge, so do the blooms. They are encompassed in a very stiff bract, and from that bract emerges 
uh, this lovely white flower with a yellow throat. It's really cute. It looks good in mass. It's a wonderful ground cover, great in front of the border. It's very, very pretty. This is another genus among the landscape gingers. This is Globa, known for her exotic and tropical blooms. This is Globa grandiflora. She's two feet tall, and she has a beautiful 15, 12 to 15 inch inflorescence, a pendant inflorescence, and it's held on a reed-like stem. The weight of the colorful bracts and the extending flowers is pretty heavy so that it bobs. The weight of the inflorescence bobs on that slender reed-like stem. Someone looked at the flowers and thought, hey, those little flowers look like little ladies dancing. And the name stuck. So this is Globa grandiflora. She's uh, exquisitely beautiful. She has gray-green leaves. Those bracts are a mauvey purple. And uh, she clumps very tightly. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't multiply very well. Uh, you will have one plant one year, maybe two plants the next year. but uh, So you need a few of them if you're going to fill in the space. But she's quite beautiful. This is Globa White Dragon, the white dancing lady. It has really spectacular summer blooms. Uh, these are 10 inches. Uh, the inflorescence is about 10 inches. She can be about 18 inches. Uh, she's a beautiful white bracts, pure white bracts with extending yellow flowers. And again, the weight of the inflorescence causes that reed-like stem to have it to bob. Uh, she has fluid in motion all summer. She will bloom late June through September. If it gets cold, she will stop blooming, but she blooms in the heat of the summer. I mean, this is exquisite. She clumps very tightly. She's a long-lived plant. Uh, I've had the same plant for many, many years. She clumps very, very slowly. So if you want to fill a space in quickly, you have to buy a bunch of them. This is a brand new introduction for 2020, thanks to Tim Chapman out of Gingerwood Nursery. This is Globa Perfect White. She has bright white bracts, very tightly held, with long extending yellow flowers. What makes her so unusual is that this is a pendant type of dancing lady that produces bulbils. Usually this type of flower do not produce bulbils. Uh, a bulbil is an asexual type of reproductive units, ball-shaped structure located at the base of the inflorescence and in its leaf axle. From every single bulbil, once it drops to the ground, it will produce another plant so that this particular plant can colonize. Or you can take the bulbils and plant them and hopefully produce a plant next year. This is Globa Perfect Purple. She's another brand new introduction by Tim Chapman for this year. This is another pendant type uh, globa that produces bulbils. Uh, she has a pale mauve bracts uh, with uh, extending yellow stamens. Uh, she's very pretty. She's about 18 inches tall and the bulbils will be placed at the back of her inflorescence and at the leaf axles. You can actually tap the, the plant once the uh, bulbils are mature and they can fall into your hand or into a bowl. You can collect them and then uh, plant them up and hopefully they will generate a new plant next year. Or you can let them fall to the ground and have a small colony. These plants like to go dormant in October. As soon as that cold wind comes and touches the leaves, they will drain all their energy from the bracts, from the stems, from the leaves, store it in the rhizome, and keep it there until May, late May. And then they will reemerge the next spring and have a new flowering season, being more mature and hopefully have colonized. This is Yellow Dancing Girl or Globa Schomburgii. She is infamous among Globa uh, aficionados because of her ability to produce bubbles. She's a round inflorescence, actually. She has a tight yellow round ball, and she's always in bloom. She's easy to grow in shade, easy to grow in sun. She's just an easy one. Uh, she produces bubbles freely, and you can see from this photo uh, the bulbils are actually those round bumpy balls at the base of her inflorescence. Now, when they're mature, they fall to the ground. This one colonizes easily. Uh, I recommend these for young people, for children, because they love to play with those baubles. Uh, my children used to collect them and make mud pies and decorate with them. They're fun. It's a fun plant.
This is a slide that shows you uh, how a mature bulbil will germinate. Uh, if a Globus schimberkii actually produces uh, bulbils early in the year, say in late June, by August, these bulbils will have germinated and created kikis. Kikis are little plants that are identical to the parent plant because bulbils are reproduced asexually. So these little ger bulbils will germinate. Sometimes, as in the slide to the right, you'll see that the kikis have actually bloomed and produce bulbils of their own. That's a fun thing. You can actually separate the kikis from the parent plant and plant them. And you can pot them up or put them in the ground. Uh, it's a fun way of learning about bulbils and asexual reproduction and about Globus schimberkii. Another landscape ginger are camphirias or peacock gingers. They're called peacock gingers because of their elaborately decorated leaves. This is camphiria rotunda or tropical crocus. They're called crocus because they are the blooms uh, that uh, flower at springtime in late spring. The blooms appear just as the leaves emerge. And literally, sometimes the blooms will be there and no leaf. The first time I ever saw something like that, I forgot I had planted it. I went and got the neighbor and dragged her over there and made her bend down the ground to look at these little four-inch flowers. I said, isn't that so pretty? She just got up and left. But she didn't appreciate their beauty. But they're beautiful, beautiful, delicate blossoms. They are white flowers with beautiful uh, purple petals, and then eventually this very dramatic leaf comes, uh, emerges. They have a burgundy back, back with these beautifully decorated uh, leaves, which are about 18 inches tall. They're dark green that feathers into lighter green with silver highlights. Very beautiful, easy to grow in shade. Cantheria alva. She's known for her mammoth-sized leaves. She, the leaves grow 12 inches long and 8 inches wide. She gets about 10 inches tall. Her leaves are dramatic with bronze brush strokes with silver highlights against green bands. Even her flowers are beautiful and large. They are a frosted lilac, almost like frosted lipstick. And they're always in the center crown. You find a plant, you always see a flower. This plant clumps very slowly. One plant, two plant, three plants, very tightly, never colonizing. So after many years, you just have a cluster of this one plant. So it takes a few plants to create a mass effect. This has been named by John Banta, the hybridizer, for his hometown of Alva, Florida. It goes dormant when the cold winds blow in in late October, early November, and reemerges when everything warms up in late May. An old garden favorite is Camphiria silver spot or peacock ginger. The leaves are very distinctive peacock pattern. They have bands of dark green feathering into light green, feathering into another dark green band. Very distinctive. There's always a frosted dark purple flower in its central crown. They're short. They get 10 inches high tops. They look great in front of the border because it's, it's very dramatic for these, uh, these leaves uh, against all other plants. They grow dormant in October and reemerge in May. This is a classic peacock ginger, Camphiria satin checks. It has a checkerboard pattern on its leaves of burgundy brush strokes and a checkerboard pattern and the leaf actually has a satiny sheen. They grow in clusters with these wonderful frosted lavender flowers in its central crown. It's very distinctive and it's a fun plant to grow in front of the border. Again, they only get 10 inches tall and they go dormant in October, reemerges in May. This peacock ginger has had a little difficulty with its name. For a couple of decades, it's been known as Camphiria pulchra mansonii, but it's now been renamed Camphiria pulchra manson. It's a peacock ginger that's super hardy, super easy to grow. It colonizes. It reseeds very easily. It has beautifully pattern shaped leaves. Uh, it has brush strokes of darker uh, green against lighter green with silver highlights, and it has lavender frosted flowers. As the summer progresses, as the heat temperatures rise, it loses some of its pattern, so it comes essentially a dark green leaf. 
it is a very hardy one, easy to grow in difficult areas. I put this where the dogs go to the bathroom. It didn't seem to care. I put it underneath a treehouse where the kids would jump from the treehouse onto this cushion and they still grew. So it's a very hardy plant for active families. This slide shows what a little problem we have with camphirias. This particular plant is Camphiria albomarginata or green flat leaf. As you can see, this is decorated with a few holes. Some of these holes have been created by snails munching on them. The leaf in the forefront is actually when the leaf was furled and uh, tender, a pine needle pierced it so that when it unfurled, it had these series of holes. But that's that's just one of the problems of having a low growing tender leaf. This is the same plant as before but without the decorated snail damage. It is Camphiria albomarginata. Albomarginata because it has a single white spot on the purple flower. It is a really fun tropical plant for in front of the border. After maturity, the leaves are almost leathery and they lay prostate to the ground, almost curling around a pot. Or I like to have them uh, in a flower bed. I have rocks in, as an edging and they actually curl around the rocks. It's a beautiful, fun plant, very unusual, very decorative. And again, it falls dormant in fall and reappears in spring. This is another flat leaf ginger, Camphiria galanga, red flat leaf. You've seen this before in the edible section of the culinary gingers. It is a galanga, that means it's rhizomes or edible, used in soups and stew, or curry ginger. They have mammoth red dinner plate sized leaves. They're humongous and such a flush of color, such a beautiful burgundy. That white flower with a purple lip is just dramatically beautiful. Again, you have it in the front of the border. Sometimes I like to pair it in a container. I'll put it in the front of the container and some small curcuma behind it just for a little filler thriller and spiller. Uh, this is a, a fun plant to use and it's very unusual. You don't often see flat prostate leaves hugging the ground as if they're afraid to fly off. This is a new Camphiria introduction for us this year. Thanks to Gardino's Nursery out of Florida. This is Camphiria angustifolia, Laos Silver Stripes. It is beautiful, stunning, just strikingly beautiful leaves. Silver against a gray-green background. It's new and rare and really a different ginger. You can grow it in a pot, you can grow it in front of the border, but it's so different, those lance-shaped leaves. The first time I saw it actually peek out from, I put them in four inch pots this year because you, you don't want to overwater these guys during the winter. I, well, the first time I saw it emerge, it's still striking. It's striking when they emerge and they're striking when they're mature. Uh, there are beautiful white with a purple tipped petal in, uh, that emerges out of the center crown. Very pretty. This is a very pretty, very unusual plant. We have not tried it for hardiness, but I'm willing to give it a try. Uh, if you're afraid, keep it in a pot, but keep it dry over the winter. You don't want these to get too wet. In our greenhouses over the winter, we just give them a whisper of water every week so the rhizomes don't dry out. Another landscape ginger. This is Siphonochilus kirkii, African ginger. They used to be two different species. The pink one used to be Siphonochilus kirkii, and the yellow used to be Siphonochilus decora. But through genetic research, they found that they're the exact same species. So they're now, they're now called pink form and yellow form. We actually have the pink form for sale. And it's a lovely, lovely plant. It's short. It's about 15 inches tall. Uh, it has uh, beautifully, softly pleated leaves. Uh, they emerge leaves first, then shortly followed by a leaf, a flower stalk. And from that, we have lots of flowers that emerge in succession. Uh, it's a native to Zimbabwe, Africa and it's very, very tropical. We've put it in the garden, Mercer Gardens, for several years, and it would come back year after year, but a very strong uh, freeze took it out. So we've tried it again, and uh, it grows pretty well in pots, but keep it dry over the winter. Only give it whispers of water uh, so the rhizome doesn't dry out. These are shell gingers. They're a wonderful landscape accent plant. 
They're so named shell gingers because of the long pendant shell-like blooms on a tall stem. This is a Alpinia zarambet. It has long, two foot long leaves that are very stiff, but when you crush them, they have a deep, spicy ginger fragrance. Even in a very, super hot day, the essential oils bubble up from the leaf and are very fragrant. They grow in tight, tight clusters. Alpinia zarambet gets 10 feet tall. It's a wonderful uh, landscape um, accent for back of the border if you want to hide something like your neighbor's yard. This is a great plant for it. It takes a lot for it to freeze down, but it only blooms if the stems have not frozen back. This is an example of an Alpinia zarambet inflorescence. You can see it's a huge panicle of shell-shaped blossoms, and they open up to, for you to see this yellow flower with these bright um, pollination guides. In the lower right hand corner you can see what they look like. Uh, it's almost encased in a stiff bract that opens up and this these this panicle of shells just fall open. They're quite beautiful and they almost always bloom around Mother's Day. But remember they only bloom if they're not frozen back. And once they have bloomed they will never bloom again. So you just cut them to the ground and it only encourages a new leaf stalk so that next year you'll have another series of these beautiful blossoms. This is me getting on my soapbox. This is Alpinia zarambet variegata. She is a shell ginger. She's usually four feet tall, but there are eight foot examples out there. She looks really best in the shade. I often see this plant planted in full sun and she's usually ragged by the end of the year. She usually has burnt edges. She looks really great in the shade. She looks like a golden orb of light. Uh, she's very, very pretty if planted in the right spot. This is another variegated shell ginger, Alpinia Chinese goddess or Yu Hua ginger. Yu Hua, I understand, means rain splashed in Chinese, which describes the variegation of this bright gold rain splashed look against a green background. It's very different, very, very hardy. The blooms. If it is not frozen back, it will start to bloom in May, but it's a repeat bloomer. It often has new stalks that will bloom all throughout the summer, even if it's hot. It just can't be frozen back. Uh, the blooms are typical of a shell ginger, with a long panicle of shell-like blooms that open up to a yellow flower with red pollination guides. It's a beautiful plant. It gets eight feet tall. It's not very common in the trade, but it's available at Mercer. We love this plant. Alpinia formosana pinstripe, or the variegated shell ginger. It has beautiful blue-green leaves with white pinstriping on every single leaf. And if not frozen back, it will, every single stalk will have an upright inflorescence of white flowers with this pretty cherry pink center. It's really quite beautiful. And the flowers last a long time, easily six weeks, five to six weeks. Uh, this is actually this spring. This is my clump at home, and uh, it was just outstanding. It's slow to clump. You can buy one plant and it will clump gently year after year. It's a tight clump. It doesn't, um, it doesn't take over and if after every bloom you cut off that stem so that it will have a chance to reemerge. Don't cut off every one of them at the same time. Do it gradually so it has a chance to um, flush out. Another shell ginger, this is Alpinia oxophylla china white. And this is what my plant looked like this a couple weeks ago. Uh, she had this cluster of pink shell-like blooms that opened up in succession, starting at the bottom and going up to the top. Really, really pretty. It's a showstopper. Uh, the, the blooms, the actual inflorescence can be 12 inches tall. The plant itself is easily six feet tall. And this is what the plant looked like after it finished blooming. Uh, you can see the new stalks starting to emerge. And I haven't yet had an ability to cut, cut off the old ones. But they have blue-green leaves and it likes the shade. It can take filtered sun, but not full sun. Full sun will cause the leaves to burn. It likes water and it will only bloom if it has not been frozen back. This is Alpinia vitata, the super tropical 
super gorgeous variegated shell ginger. The variegation is very dramatic. Strong, white bands against a blue-green leaf. Very striking. It's three feet tall. Will bloom if it's been kept all warm and in perfect condition. It has pink bracts with greenish white flowers, but you don't grow it for the bloom. You grow it for the variegation, for the striking foliage. This has to be grown in a pot. There's no way this plant would make it through the winter. If a cold wind touches the leaf, it'll just it'll fail. It won't it won't work. So when the cold weather is expected Put it in your greenhouse. Put it inside. Don't even bother putting it in the garage. It won't make it. But it's a very tropical plant. And if you have the conditions for it, you can keep it over inside over the winter. It'll be fine. And it'll grow. And it'll bloom. And you'll have a beautiful, dramatic, tropical plant. Another great landscape ginger is the zingiber family, or the pine cone gingers. This is zingiber, zarambet, variegata, darcii. It is a typical um, zingiber in that it has arching canes. This one is really pretty because of the white variegation against the green. Very pretty. It always has a separate stalk that produces these pine cone-like inflorescences. They start out little oval balls and then grow elongated. From every bract emerges a creamy flower and eventually it grows up and up and up and as it matures it turns a crimson red. When you squeeze the pine cone, a fragrant ooze gushes out. This fragrant ooze is very, very fragrant. In fact, Paul Mitchell and other shampoo companies will use this fragrant ooze in their shampoos. It is called, when you look on a shampoo bottle, it is called Awapuhi, and that is is the inflorescence that produces it. What happens is uh, when it rains or when you use a sprinkler, the water actually gets collected into those bracts, making it a special uh, special fragrant ooze. Very cool plant. And if you have a mature plant, you have a series of these pine cones. And they're, it's just fun. You can go squeeze them, put them on your neck, get all fragrant, and go kiss your husband. And he says, oh, you smell so good. Another very special pine cone ginger is Zingiber Twice as Nice. It's named by Tim Chapman, who introduced it. Uh, he's from Gingerwood Nursery in uh, Louisiana. This is a twice as nice because of the inflorescence. The inflorescence appears at the tip of the leaf stalk and as a separate stem. This only reaches two feet tall, so it's great uh, in a perennial border. It doesn't take over. It clumps very nicely. It is super hardy. Uh, it, it's just easy to grow and easy to bloom. And every single pine cone has that fragrant ooze. And you see the back, in the middle in the back, you'll see that terminal tipped inflorescence. They don't grow very big, but still they're there. It's very unusual, and it's a lot of people's favorite gingerbread. A very tropical zingiber is zingiber macrodinium chocolate ball or chocolate beehive ginger. The blooms or the inflorescences will appear on a separate stalk, basally. That means at the bottom of the plant. There are no terminal flowers on this particular plant. Uh, the plant actually grows six feet tall, but these are very tall inflorescences, maybe 18 inches tall, with a big round um, ball of an inflorescence with chocolate colored bracts and from each bract or an orchid shaped bloom that is cream colored and maroon. It also has a fragrant ooze coming from the bracts and they're very different, very tropical. It must be grown in a container or if you do grow it in the ground then you need to lift the plant and let it go dormant, perhaps in a heated garage or in your washing room. It'll go dormant, in other words, the leaves, because it got cold, the leaves will just uh, fall down and let it, um, let it separate from the rhizome before you remove them. And then just give it a whisper of water every week or so, just so the rhizomes don't dry out. And then in the springtime, when everything is past, like late April, early May, you bring it back out and it'll reemerge. And if you do dig it up and lift it, just put it in a big pot until you're ready to plant it back out again. This is the last genus for landscape gingers, and this is Costas, or spiral gingers. Spiral gingers are so named because the leaves are arranged spirally around the stem, 
the stem also have a tendency to twirl or, or, or spiral like a corkscrew. So it makes a great accent plant. A lot of costas, like this costa scaber, have tubular flowers. Tubular flowers are like goblets of nectar to hummingbirds. I have many different kinds of costas, so I have hummingbirds all year. Costa scaber is very easy to grow and bloom. It starts in late May and continues until frost knocks it down. When freezes knock it down, you have, don't have any particular care. You just whack off the stems, and when it starts to warm up, they'll start to grow again. The bracts, for every single bract, there is a tubular flower. So this will, it's an indeterminate inflorescence, which means it will continue to grow and grow and grow, as long as you give it water. It likes a little food, so every month, give it a little food, uh, some 12, 12, 12, 12, whatever you've got. Just throw it on there, and it'll continue to grow and bloom. Another great costas is Chilocosta speciosus. It used to be called just plain old Costa speciosus, but it was reclassified. So now it's Chilocosta speciosus. It is a fun, beautiful plant. Uh, it is a spiral ginger with a terminal cone, a red stiff bracts, and from every bract emerges this white flower. It's a deep tubular flower with a frilly uh, corolla. It looks like crepe paper, which gives it its common name, crepe ginger. It, it has a deep throat, so it's a, it's a big attractor for bees, solitary bees, honeybees, who like to crawl into that tube, gather the nectar, and then fly out. Chilocosta speciosus as a plant. As you can see in the bottom of the plant, there are some spiraling. The stems spiral around. Uh, the leaves are just, it looks like a stepladder for a little fairy to walk up on. At the terminal tip is the red stiff bracts and the white uh, frilly flowers. The white frilly flowers will continue. It'll start in June and continue as long as you water it and give it a little fertilizer every month. The flowers will continue throughout the heat, throughout the August, throughout the September, but in early October it stops flowering. So that all you have is this, are these stiff red bracts. By Thanksgiving, those bracts will be filled with shiny black ebony seeds. And they will uh, have a, be a beautiful decoration for fall flower arrangements. Really a spectacular plant for summer decoration and for fall decoration. Those seeds are quite viable. So that when eventually the seeds fall to the ground and the next season, we will have little plantlets so that you'll have more Chilocasa speciosus the following year. This is the red tower ginger, or Costus camosus. It used to be classified as Costus barbatus, but it was found that that's a different plant entirely, so they named this one Costus camosus. Uh, it is uh, red tower ginger in that its inflorescence consists of stiff red bracts that are recurved. They curve downward. And from every bract are these yellow tubular flowers. This is a huge hummingbird attractor. Huge. If I have any plant in there, I can have I can have Clarodendron paniculatum. I can have all sorts of plants. They go to this one. They love it. They visit it all the time, every day, different times of the day. Uh, that is a it keeps continually to grow. It starts out as a small inflorescence but keeps growing and growing and growing. You have to fertilize it once a month, make sure it stays well watered, and it continues to grow. You can, this, uh, this is a plant. This is on the far right. This is actually in a container in my garden. It's one giant container and this is in uh, late July and these plants, uh, the inflorescences, have grown this tall. These are very commonly found in Hawaii. So this is a bit of Hawaii in your own garden but they are a great hummingbird attractor. Now, to the secret of how to get these guys to forever be in bloom. I will, when it gets start to get cold, I will make room for it in the, in the, green, in the garage uh, because my greenhouse is, is jam-packed. So in the garage, because this is a big plant, I will uh, trim off these stems that have blooms on them and I'll use them for propagation. I'll, 
I'll put them in some pots and I'll propagate them over the winter time. And so the blooms, excuse me, the stems that do not have blooms will be stored in the garage. I'll put heat lamps in the garage and that's all it takes to keep it warm throughout the winter. Occasionally I'll drag it out to water it, but then when it gets cold, I'll put it back in the garage. And every year I get these stems that have these gorgeous blooms on them. This is a very different inflorescence for Acostas. They have yellow bracts and orange tubular flowers. And they still have that wonderful spiral stem. This is a much larger inflorescence than, say, Acostas lazius, which is also a yellow uh, bract flower. But this is, it's a bigger bract and it's easy to bloom. You just water it and fertilize it and it blooms freely on every single stem. Now, if you cut off a stem, that stem will never sprout again with a flower. So it's one inflorescence, one stem. And it's a very pretty thing. Uh, the orange tubular flowers are great hummingbird attractors. So again, this is a great one for that. It can be grown in a large container or in the ground. They're fairly hardy. An unusually pretty inflorescence is Costas Green Mountain. It has pinky orange bracts tipped in green with golden yellow flowers. The tubular flowers are great hummingbird attractors. This is a beginning of the inflorescence and eventually it will grow into a cone shape. Uh, it is again a spiral ginger. The stems have a tendency to spiral. It does, it's a pretty short one. It maybe gets three feet tall. It usually can be grown in a container. If you grow it in the ground, you need to lift it and protect it from freezes because it's rather tender. This is a fun costas because you can eat the flowers and amaze your friends. Uh, it's a tiny little thing, about three feet tall. It has red inflorescence, red bracts, and orangey red flowers that emerge from every single bract. The first time I saw this was in Espinades in Florida. They are everywhere. And uh, at one time we went to a home tour, and the gentleman said, Did you know you could eat the flowers? And I was really hesitant, but he ate one, he gave it to me, and they taste rather peppery. So almost all tubular flowers I'm going to taste. I'm just going to eat them to see what happens because they're very flavorful. This is an easy one to grow in a pot. I've grown it in my home for 12 years, but I actually protect it with a frost cloth during the winter. Uh, if it's uh, a very cold one, it will not, if a cold winter, it will not return. So I protect it. Uh, I protect it with a frost cloth, sometimes a couple of frost cloths, but it always returns. Another great costas for our area, and it's fairly hardy, is Costas Tropicae. It was first introduced by Dave Skinner, who is the great costas expert. Uh, a young woman had told him about this, that she had brought it from Central America, Central South America, and he'd never seen it before. So he grew it out and realized it was a new variety. And uh, so he named it after her, Costas Tropicae. And it's a, it's a really fun plant. It has uh, the spiral stems terminating in the red bracts and the pink flowers, so it's a little uh, ruffled corolla. Hummingbirds love it. It's easy to grow in our area, so give it a try. I would like to introduce you to the most floriferous costas I've ever grown. This is Costas visiligulatus. It's a fun name. It's actually called a African princess costas. What makes this plant so spectacular is the size of these blossoms. These are three inches across and they will start blooming anytime. Uh, in uh, late May, early May, when it feels like it, as long as it's warm, it's going to produce a flower. And it's a short one. It gets maybe three or four feet tall, but it's always in bloom. You keep it watered, you feed it once a month, and it's going to bloom with these masses of pink flowers. It's super easy. You can grow it in the ground. You can grow it in a pot. Uh, you can take a cutting. I've taken cuttings of these plants, stuck it in the a pot in a Ziploc bag under a heating mat under grow lights and by the time I pull it out it's already blooming. It's easy to grow, easy to bloom. But we haven't really tested it for hardiness. Uh, so in the gardens we actually had to lift it because I was concerned that it would freeze. But what I'm going to do next year, I'm going to leave it in the ground. I'll take a few cuttings so if it doesn't make it over the winter at least I have a copy of it. It's a really fun plant to try. I'd like to introduce you to a stunning, tropical, variegated Costas. Costas Arabicus variegata. She's beautiful. She has green, white variegation, shades of white, shades of green on every leaf, and every stem terminates in a inflorescence 
with green and white bracts. From every bract is a soft, pale, pink, tubular flower with a ruffled corolla. Beautiful plant. She's tender. Every year, about in October, early November, when we anticipate a freeze, we have to lift her. So we lift her, we store her in her pot, and we put her in the greenhouse where she keeps nice and warm, and we put her back out the following spring when all the temperatures have rise, have been considerably, consistently warm. And so her stems, because they're never really freeze back, they can get five feet tall. And if they look a little ratty, sometimes because when you lift something, they go into shock and they sometimes lose a few leaves. So I have a tendency that in the following spring, I will take those stems and I'll tack them to the ground. So at some leaf axles, they'll root and then uh, the from that rooting will create a new plant. So that's a fun way to propagate this one. It's very easy to grow in shade. If you grow it in sun, that white will burn. It'll be crispy leaves. You give it water, food once a month, this plant will grow, it'll bloom, and it'll look like a soft white light in the shade. I wanted you to see what a ginger garden looks like in full swing. This is say in August. Uh, these plants are growing, uh, they are blooming, they're healthy. You mulch the gingers, you feed them once a month, and you give them water when they need it, once or twice a week. And they grow, they bloom, they look great. And the cat's name is Spike. This is the same garden of following winter. Uh, the plants didn't even have time to go into full dormancy. They didn't have time to drain all of their energy from their leaves to their rhizome. They were covered in a blanket of snow. But because I took care of the plants during the summer, I fertilized, I watered, I mulched, these guys all came back. I didn't lose a single plant. Moral of the story, gingers are hardier than you think they are. They look delicate, they look exotic, they look tropical. But in the end, if you take care of them, they're hardy. This is what I like to do at the height of the ginger season. I like to make cut flower arrangements to give away. Uh, this is a collection of all the gingers that are in bloom in August. Gingers are for summer. They bloom, they grow, and they're beautiful. Have a happy summer. Grow a few gingers.